note, it is now four o'clock yeah. Eastern and <laughs> time for the presentation to start. Hi, I'm Joe Kneeven from the Wilmington Public Library in Ohio. I will be your moderator for this session. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsors, um, Equinox, um, ECDI, and Kipu. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters, Ruth Frazier Davis from Evergreen, Indiana and ECDI and Rogan Hamby from Equinox. Take it away and I will stop sharing my screen and fade into the background. Share my screen and get oriented again where we're at. Thank you. Joe. Okay, we're going to talk about Aspen and the, the name of the presentation was using Aspen. And so I'm going to do that. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Rogan, introduce your own self. All right. My name is Rogan Hamby. I am with one of the three sponsors of the, this track of the pre, uh, conference, which is the Equinox Open Library Initiative. Uh, you know, I always feel that I have to point out to people that I spent about 20 years working in reference for mainly public libraries with a little bit of presence at special and academic libraries before I came over to Equinox. And I really wanted to say that here because that is the point of view that I'm coming from. For those who saw the vendor lightning talks, uh, if you want to talk to a salesperson, I'm going to refer you to Felicia. And she talked about Aspen a little bit and had some great information in it. I'm going to talk at a very high and abstract level about this as a person who implements Aspen, but who, when they started implementing Aspen for libraries, went, man, I wish I'd had this when I was working my six-hour shifts on the reference desk. Is sometimes more like eight because people called in sick at the last minute. Uh, when I was working my eight-hour shifts at the reference desk, and it would have made that on the point instruction for search so much easier. So that's where I'm coming at it from, uh, from the point of view of somebody who helps libraries implement this and somebody who can't quite let go their background as a reference library. And I will pass it on to Ruth. And that is an awesome introduction. Uh, I'm Ruth Davis and I am the coordinator for Evergreen Indiana Library Consortium. At this moment, I have this hat on. Uh, and I am going to, I'm here with Rogan because we just recently deployed Aspen uh, Discovery for the entirety of our consortium, which is 130 public libraries and, and some additionals. Um, uh, we'll actually be launching our 130th public library on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, a week from today. And, um, but kind of like Rogan, I just can't seem to let go of my non-evergreen admin. <laughs> I have been a library director and also um, just a front a front line librarian uh, working circulation and tech services and all of that for the past, well, not 15 years, I'd say probably uh, was close to 10 or 15 years before um, getting, uh, coming to the admin side of things. And I have always, I love the power aspect of evergreen search, which we'll talk about but I love the, uh, the patron experience um, of what Aspen provides and the way that it also empowers, as Rogan was saying, reference staff and other library staff people to really leverage um, search for discovery uh, for their, their patrons. So I'm excited to also, I, I'm not real active on Blue Sky, but you can contact me there. I got an account because of Evergreen, but now I kind of like it. So hit me up. 
And I'm going to roll this over to Rogan. Yeah. Well, we're mostly going to do this in two parts, me talking and then Bruce handling the second half of the slides. But there is a little bit of back and forth that's going to happen, partially because neither of us are very good at keeping our mouth shut. Um, <laughs> we're both opinionated. Uh, so why are we talking about Aspen? Well, Aspen and Evergreen go really well together. They make It makes patrons happy. And it's really kind of that simple. It's been very popular over the last few years. It's kind of exploded. Uh, you've heard Felicia during her lightning talk mention that. And it's reflected in this conference. We have two presentations on it. Uh, ours today and another one tomorrow. It started as a fork of viewfind, but now is really its own distinct thing with the development on it done by Mark Noble and a lot of nice evergreen integration from uh, Galen Charlton and Jason Boyer. I worked on some of the Mark exporting scripts for it, and it works really well. Now, we're not here to sell this to you. We're here to talk about what if you used it as your OPAC. So there are some pros, some cons, but I also want to say that development is happening pretty quickly on it. So if you come back to this video in three months, some things may have changed. And that's a great thing because these development work pieces are incredible. And I look forward to more and more integration with Evergreen to make it more of a true OPAC experience. All right. Now, I spent a moment of time wondering if I should talk about it as a discovery layer versus an OPAC and where this fits with discovery systems. You know what? I decided, who cares? We're just going to call it an OPAC for our purposes, and let's just move on. So let's talk about some of the challenges of using the Evergreen OPAC, just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. I don't know who all is watching this presentation and in chat. I've used Evergreen since 1.2 or 1.4, long enough ago that I don't remember the precise version. And I know we do have a lot of people here who've been with Evergreen for a long time. So we've seen different iterations of the OPAC. The current one is commonly called the BUPAC. Uh, and it's certainly an improvement over the previous OPAC, but it's not perfect. And one of the major challenges of it is customization. Honestly, to work with customizing the OPAC for the most part, you need backend access to the servers, which can be hard to get because it, it, there are real security and stability issues with who can get back there. You need knowledge of not just HTML, but template toolkit, which means some Perl. You need knowledge of CSS, which is probably the easiest of these things to have. And it, it's a bear. So that, that is something that frustrates a lot of people. I, have wor I work in migrations a lot, and it is not uncommon for me to talk to a library that says, well, we have a web designer on staff. Can they do this? And when I say, well, are they familiar with template toolkit and the bits of evergreen that that has to interact with? Of course, they don't. That's literally what they're going with a hosting entity for. Another issue is speed. Now, I put on here fastest subjective because I have to admit, I don't have an issue with Evergreen search speed and performance. I find it fairly responsive. But over the years, I've heard a lot of people express that they don't feel that it is as quick as they would like it to be. So I want to acknowledge that as a perception, even if I don't personally share it. Uh, Jessica Wolford mentions, not to mention command line Linux. Yes, just knowing Linux can be a challenge. Thank you for pointing that out. I sometimes forget that. <laughs> and Kathy says, some of us have measured the speed just saying. Yes, I, I, Kathy has been a long time uh, uh, proponent of wanting faster search solutions. And this is, this is one of those things too, uh, talking about speed that if you ever, when we have it in person conference and you ever want to talk about speed, this is a great like outside of a session conversation because it can go on for hours. Um, and become recursive. 
It does, but we still keep talking about it. And finally, electronic record management. You know, ebooks are wonderful. They have been a boon to libraries for reaching communities and users. Uh, I have issues with the nature of the cost and licensing of some of the ebook providers, but we're not going to get into that here. But obviously, we do want people to be able to search these as easily as possible. And people have found challenges with maintaining these collections in their catalog. And Evergreen does not have a really convenient way of refreshing, say, a large new batch of records from Hoopla or somebody. Okay, so let's move on. And I'm going to pass this back to Ruth for talking about it from a consortium point of view. Yeah, so uh, and I could go back to the other slide. These really go in here. But the overarching theme is that in a consortium, of course, you have all of these libraries that have unique identities, unique community identities. And then um, there has been an expectation that this kind of one size fits all uh, patron experience through the OPAC should be good enough. And of course, it is um, overly technical. We have already mentioned a few of those reasons. Um, to do local, uh, I have local engagement that, oh, that's a whole other topic um, that I could go into, but then customization, uh, you think about if it's just one library that doesn't have the staff, now scale that to a hundred or more libraries and all of a sudden customization becomes a, a, just a non-starter in terms of the evergreen OPEC, unless you have unlimited time and unlimited money. And I have not yet met that organization. And if you know them, um, I will be leaving Evergreen Indiana and would like to come work for them, whoever they are, they don't exist. Uh, and when we have a lack of customization, we have a lack of identity. We've, we have struggled a lot in Evergreen Indiana on both supporting, to both support the libraries support their um, their local communities as we support their local library, but still provide support at scale. And so that has been a major challenge. And with Aspen, we feel like we are addressing that. So we'll go into the next one. Brogan, take it away for the more technical stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh let me first say a couple of things I think I neglected to mention at the beginning, one of which is feel free to interrupt us. Post questions, we'll be glad to answer them. I don't like people to hold questions till the end. There will be a QA slash discussion period at the end, but I don't want people to forget that they wanted to ask something. And just about the funding, I have proposed that every, every uh, state, U.S. state, with a lottery should do a flat 15% of profits directly to libraries. But so far, I've not been able to convince uh, any legislators of that. So how does Aspen solve some of these challenges that the Evergreen OPAC has? Well, one of them is the customization. A lot can be customized in the UI, and I do mean a lot. And it has some really nice elements to it, such as warning about differentiation, of colors against background for accessibility purposes. And it also allows you to insert JavaScript and CSS, which is part of its sort of heritage of having some of its developers have a strong Koha background. Koha does that, uh, it, which as somebody who also does Koha migrations, I can tell you is a wonderful tool. The speed, it is based on a solar database. And it is much more streamlined than the evergreen one. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. It, but it has a very specific function of showing results to end users based on their search terms and indexes. No more, no less. And then electronic record management. It does a couple of things for this. One, it has really well implemented APIs for some services like OverDrive, Hoopla, Cloud Library. Now, Ever Evergreen has some of this too, but the thing that really sets it apart in my mind is the sideloading scopes. I, in fact, I would love to see this in Evergreen. 
And it makes it very easy for a library to say, hey, we want these records. Maybe they're from, say, a local newspaper index, or they're from the service nobody's ever heard of, or they're from a state genealogical service. And we're going to sideload them. We don't want them to be, we don't want to put them in our ILS, but we want them exposed to a sort of federated search within Aspen. And whenever we get a fresh set of them from our vendor, partner, whoever, just very easily refresh them. And it's a wonderful so solution I, for that. I want to pick a couple things out of here specifically. Um, first of all, for the customization and the JavaScript and uh, the CSS here, that there is a library, um, uh, like a, a code snippet library, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to even really be all that familiar with either one of those things. You just kind of need to know what you want to have accomplished, and it has little snippets that maybe all of a sudden then you have the ability to just tweak a little thing insert it into a field actually you don't even have to like do anything special other than put it into the field and then if you do have a little bit more experience with um, either one of those markups that you can go beyond what's in that library and test out different things to make it even more customized and then I want to talk about the electronic record management for just a second in the consortium in Evergreen Indiana uh, Almost all of our members are also members of a, an overdrive consortium, a statewide or overdrive consortium. Statewide is kind of a fraught term, but anyway, it is what it is. But there are over 200 libraries in that statewide overdrive consortium. And what we are doing right now, well, what we were doing, we're not doing it anymore and we're getting ready to clean them up, is we were getting exports records from Overdrive, this is completely neglecting. We also did this for Hoopla, but from Overdrive and adding those to the database, the Evergreen database, and then maintaining that and, and using uh, not a, well, we did use partially API for that, um, but the number of records that are going into our bibliographic database that are basically kind of mucking it up a little bit for our catalogers and that we'll no longer have to do that um, because they're now going to be connected through Aspen. So patrons will be able to discover them, check them out, all of those things. But they're not going to be in the Evergreen database, which is also going to improve the performance of the Evergreen database as well. So that was, for me, the electronic record management and, and the side loading scopes, those were the most exciting part, along with also that the local um, customization that we can do. Mm -hmm. And I let's go back one second. Uh, yeah, I said I was going to keep this high level, but I, I do want to say something additional about the side loading scopes, specifically to those in the evergreen community who are currently really steadfastly trying to maintain those 856 subfield nines to correctly show where, say, their cloud library records are supposed to show. You know, you, you have 30 libraries, 40, 50, whatever, and these 10 have cloud library, and then you're like, oh, I don't want duplicate records, and some of these records are also Hoopla, so we're going to have these two different 856s in it, and these 856s in this record need to have these seven, and these for the Hoopla need these three that overlap, but also these other five, and you're and you're constantly in mark edit and making macros for it and then reloading the records. And Aspen just lets you click some buttons and say, here's the side loading, here's the scope of libraries for it, and you get to walk away from it. It's amazing. I don't I don't know a nicer way, like a more professional way to say it. It's amazing. That's it. Okay, can I go to the next slide now? Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. <laughs> now, you've, you've heard us really gush on Aspen. It's a wonderful product. But sometimes you have to be careful about being the dog that chases the car. Uh, Aspen lets you do all these great configuration things, and it is great. But that also means that the administrative UI gives you access to many 
many things. And it means that there's a real learning curve. There's a learning curve about what you should configure. There's a learning curve with what you want to configure and then what you need to configure. Oh, did we put a thing in here about permissions? Should I wait? Should I save that till later? Yeah, you can say it now if you want. Go ahead. So there, there aren't very many permissions in Aspen. Uh, if you think about Evergreen permissions, there are like 15,000 of them. That's an exaggeration. Uh, but there are a lot of permissions, which the thing about those permissions is that you get to bundle them and you get to be very granular in who can do what in Evergreen. Uh, because there aren't very many permissions at all. Oh, yeah, 14,973. Uh, there aren't very many per permissions in Aspen. It means that when you get a permission, you have permission to do a lot. And so that has been, um, and that analogy of the dog chasing the car, what happens when you catch it uh, is, is apt because all of a sudden, and we have this in, in Evergreen, Indiana, we now have close to 90 local Aspen administrators um, that have a lot of permission. So it, it becomes very important to uh, really dial in and what they actually want to do and how to actually do it and how to not accidentally do it for everybody. Okay. Is and that they, a good way to say that? Yeah, absolutely. And again, we're trying to give you a broad level overview of things to think about if you're considering implementing Aspen and uh, having just come off the implementation of Aspen with Ruth for Indiana, these are exactly the conversations we had. Yeah. And I don't want it to sound like Aspen has every possible advantage over Evergreen's native OPAC. Evergreen's OPAC has advantages, definitely. And one of those is search power. You know, over the years, we've implemented lots of additional power user functionality in search for Evergreen. And again, this is high level, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but you can literally go through past conference presentations to see presentations about implementing some of these features and how to take advantage of them. Aspen is simple. It's simple to use, but that comes with a price. Indexing control. Those things I talked about with customizing the OPAC are abstractly true of indexing as well. You can go in and customize Evergreen to an incredible degree. And if you wanna customize exactly what fields go into exactly what indexes, there are presentations out there on that. There's documentation for it. There's a ton of power. Popularity badges is to some degree, at least a conceptual extension of that and uses circulation data to help modify search results. And I'm gonna go back to OPAC customization. If you had that infinite time and money, you could do absolutely incredible things with the Evergreen OPAC. It's the use of template toolkit means that if somebody really wanted to, they could essentially build something that neither looks nor even really behaves like the OPAC we have. Although some of that would require some back-end tweaking as well. Although if you have that kind of budget, you probably have the budget for that. So Rogan, you said we could mm -hmm. interrupt. So that's why sure. I didn't raise my hand. Um, sure. So it, first of all, I'm pretty sure those presentations you talked about that every single one of them was probably done by me before 2019. At um, least half. At least half. I, I think it was probably more than half. Okay. So, and I mentioned this in chat. I said at least. <laughs> fast is important. You know, I care about fast. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I've poured my heart and into soul, into soul into making Evergreen Search better. Probably not as much as Mike Rylander has, but you know, that that's the hard thing for me about moving away from Evergreen Native Search. But if you don't get, and I know that 
Aspen has good search, but if you don't get the results you want, you have to refine your search and do it over and over again. So you want to make sure your results are good so that you're not doing it too many times. So that's where the popularity comes in, because as I often explained way back when I first started talking about it, you do a search for Abraham Lincoln, you know, you've got thousands and thousands of titles in your database on Abraham Lincoln at that time, you know, it was a team of rivals, which would never come up top based on bibliographic data alone, because it's called the team of rivals. It's, it's the popularity that would have done it. I have a more current example, but I don't want to mention right. that man's name in, in this conference. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I can guess who. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's a really so valid So is that something that popularity is in Aspen or could be? Well, obviously it's open source, it could be, but it, it, right. is that something that's available now? Well, popularity uh, in terms of looking at the circulation data to inform the results is not something that's in Aspen. It's not doing that. Could it be? Absolutely. I'd love to see it. Yeah. That's one of those ever, I would love for Aspen to uh, literally look at the popularity badges in Evergreen and use those as part of its results. Um, and if anybody would like to fund that, I have people I can introduce you to, to talk to. <laughs> I don't have as much money as I used to, sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Um, but yeah, those are some of the pros and cons that I think we need to talk about and people need to consider. And I, I want to mention Chris Owens in chat has said, I have found the search relevance to be lacking in Aspen, particularly the search suggestion dropdown list. There, that is an advantage of the native evergreen OPAC experience. Now, my experiences so far, most institutions have found that on average for the average user, the av Aspen search experience works for what they want. And that and I for, go ahead. You say that that's exactly what what I wanted to point out too is that um, we are often having conversations about uh, needs for power users, um, and and we have definite. I mean, we have hundreds of power users at least, uh, and not just in staff, but staff are generally speaking power users at, at least. A majority of them. And so we have made the decision in Evergreen, Indiana to not ever deprecate uh, the traditional search, the native OPAC, because that is still a very valuable tool for um, a lot of the things that we're doing. Uh, we, the Aspen interface is meant to be specifically for a generalized patron experience and patron engagement tool, because there are aspects in it for that, um, that empower a generalized staff as well with limited time to go in there and do that. So you don't have to necessarily have IT level um, competence to do these customizations. You have a quality search you can check out e-materials from the interface. So we're, we're going to stick with both of those things so that we can definitely leverage the power of both of the interfaces. Yeah. And I th that's something I sometimes suggest to people. You know, don't throw away your OPAC, keep it around for power use. But I'm going to be the bad guy timekeeper here and say we need to move on. Yep. A little. And so, I've, I've moved on to the similarities okay. slide. So we spent some time talking about differences, but to some degree, I want to make sure that we're not overstating it. They both do the core stuff that you expect out of an OPAC. They both have holds, they both have search, they both have carousels, you set them up differently. Uh, meta records, although I'm using that term loosely because they're not exactly the same. Right. But again, we're not getting into the nuts and bolts in this presentation. They both do search suggestions. They both support enriched content services and providing cover images. And they both allow people to check their accounts with some caveats. Mm -hmm. uh, there are still a few places in Evergreen where we'd like to see some more integration between Aspen and, and personal accounts, but it works and works well. Okay. And there are some Evergreen features that aren't in Aspen. If you really love search term highlighting, that's not a feature. 
Uh, and if you've put a lot of effort into book plates, those aren't currently displayed. They're not a part of the bib or the item record. And so some development would be needed for Aspen to pull those from Evergreen. And Josh makes a, a good point, very good point, that curbside pickup is not uh, something that is integrated into it at this point either. Right. And I wasn't quite thinking of curbside pickup as an OPAC function, but that's a legitimate point. Absolutely. Oh, Jason Stevenson says some development for book plates is available on Launchpad. That's so. awesome. Yes. And course reserves, not that I know of. No, no, it, it Aspen is not really, to my knowledge, academically focused at this point. Um, and behind the desk holds, it would depend a little bit on how you implement them. Mm -hmm. But if you if you're thinking the way I think you're thinking of them, then no. One of the things that I will say, too, is that in terms of parity between um, the native evergreen OPAC and Aspen. Uh, I think the comment that Rogan had at the beginning was uh, very apt that uh, there has been an explosion of Aspen implementations connected to Evergreen in the past year, year and a half. Uh, maybe two years, I can extend it out there. I know that there were some, but like it has been explosive in the past year. And um, as that continues, and I believe that it will, we will see closer and closer parity as those features are developed um, because people just aren't gonna put up with them not being in there. And, and, and that is, is where development happens, um, whether it be a, a developer just being freaking annoyed or uh, users being annoyed, um, and it says Aspen support can vary wildly by ILS. Uh, and, and that's the thing too, is that we're talking about some things that are pretty specific to Evergreen uh, that don't exist in other ILS. And so we'll, they will, yeah. it will come to Evergreen users to, yeah. to really drive that development. Yeah. And obviously we're talking in an Evergreen context here. You know, mm -hmm. uh, this is an Evergreen conference. And speaking for myself, Equinox it is obviously one of the original parts of the Evergreen community, um, you know, with a, num a number of the original and very longtime members of the Evergreen community at Equinox. And so we're talking about it from that Equinox, from that Evergreen standpoint right now. But it uh is a product used by a wider ILS community. Gary has a question about does it handle parts holds well? The answer is yes, it does now. Yeah. Um, and it, it does exactly because um, there was a couple, there were a couple evergreen libraries that wanted to use Aspen and it mm -hmm. did not support parts. And so that development did happen and it handles it pretty dang well, pretty yep. seamlessly at this point from everything that I've experienced. Uh, anyway. Just to say missing support can be added, yes. Yep. So Aspen OPAC extras, and there's a lot of things in here that I can talk about these as um, patron engagement components, such as placards, which are essentially billboards. They can be billboards for programs, services, really anything you make them for. Uh, and they, you, they involve trigger words so that they show up in search results. Um, there's also different content in here that can be integrated. I don't, I don't, there's very easily, very easily. Uh, there is translation work uh, as well as additional languages that have already been translated that can be included. And then a whole variety of ways to um, integrate calendars um, into that. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to talk a little bit in a moment about some things that we have seen in Evergreen, Indiana for this. Did you want to say anything more about the extras? Yeah, I, I want to talk about one thing quickly. And that mm -hmm. is, if I was to pull anything out of this list that I really like in Aspen, it is the placards. Mm -hmm. it is, they're very simple conceptually, but I wanted to talk about them just a minute. 
they are basically what I think of as sort of advertisements. Yep. Advertisements for your library to your patrons. You set keywords and searches they appear in. You set time limits. You They can be something as simple as a link or a graphic with a link. You can get much fancier with them. And they are ways to advertise your book clubs, your events, parts of your collection. It's the holidays. So, you know, advertising your holiday cookbooks. Your strategic you, planning survey. Right. Oh, sorry, it, just it, throw that one in there. <laughs> yeah. No, but absolutely. Yeah. The, I mean, this is a core piece of functionality that we have promoted to all of our libraries to just get to communicating with their patrons. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree wholeheartedly on the placards. Okay. So I, I'll let that go and we move on. <laughs> okay. So this is what happened in Indiana. Uh, we had, of course, had the native OPAC for ever. Um, and of course, it, there was the uh, move from, well, JS PAC to TPAC to uh, BOO PAC, but it still was essentially, in our case, was styled pretty similarly in terms of, of like colors, links. It just had like rounded corners and maybe it worked a little bit better. Um, depending on who you were talking to. We have continually been growing um, as a consortium and as new members are coming on um, in this modern era, I don't know why I term that in my head, I say in the modern era, uh, they, they have expectations. I mean, they've been talking with their colleagues outside of Evergreen. They have been going to conferences. They have been, people have been selling ideas to them. And that's, that's great, I make it sound like get off my lawn. I don't mean that at all. That they have expectations for how they want to uh, engage with their communities, but we still want them to be part of, of our community as well. Um, we also found that a lot of our libraries were working around uh, things in the existing OPAC and uh, if you have been in libraries for any period of time, you are familiar with the concept of working around. And so we um, want to address that a little bit. Talked a little bit about this too, that there we just have too many member libraries to support um, bespoke customizations for OPACs and that we really wanted to um, also honor uh, something that came out of, we did a membership fee restructure in our consortium uh, that I could talk about forever and a day, and I'm not going to, but uh, some of the things that came out of that was a prioritization by our membership on patron experience and support staffing. And, um, and that saying that the interfaces that we were presenting to the public um, were not prioritizing patron experience um, at all. They, they worked, but they were not. And so uh, we wanted to do, move for that. And we found that we were also the right timeline where there were more open source discovery products being talked about. There was more of a conversation. So we had more to compare as well. So we went through a whole committee thing. It took about a year and a half uh, to go through the process um, in terms of getting a lot of information on a lot of discovery products. Not all of them were open source. We did uh, look at Viewfind as well as another open source. That was another open source alternative. Um, of course, Aspen being uh, a, a fork of that. We also knew that we had some experience. Uh, we had uh, brought on um, our largest library system to date uh, at that point. And part of that migration process, and if you go to the other Aspen um, session tomorrow, there will be a panelist there uh, from Porter County. It was Porter County Library System. 
in uh, Northwestern Indiana. And they had made the choice that, of course, they were gonna join our consortium, but they also wanted to use a discovery product. And they had selected completely independent of everything of this, Aspen Discovery. Um, and they, so they actually deployed Aspen prior to joining Evergreen and using the Evergreen ILS. Um, and their strategy was that it was going to be a more seamless interaction or transition for their patrons. Um, I'm not sure if, if that's how it actually turned out or not, uh, but a lot of lessons were learned for sure. And from, I think from everybody, including um, developers support, our admin team, their library, um, and their surrounding libraries who were watching this happen. And so that also helped inform that. So we went through all the committee work and got a, well, I'm not gonna say that. Um, we decided to go with uh, Equinox as our support provider. Uh, so we have just now uh, gone from implementation to support in the past week, I think it was, was it the past week or two weeks? I don't remember. Recently. And it's going great. Um, we have 130 deployed catalogs. If you go to our member library list at uh, evergreenindiana.org, there's a link for each of our libraries that says catalog, and you can go and see their Aspen uh, catalogs. And we have, that number is old. We have 90 verified local Aspen admins now. Um, and we also did add an informational page for our member libraries to um, reference training and other things uh, that have been part of this process so that they can continue working through that. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, follow up on Viewfind versus Aspen real quickly. It occurred mm -hmm. to me, uh, both of us mentioned that Viewfind is a fork, uh, sorry, Aspen is a fork of Viewfind. I do wanna warn people to not compare them too closely Mm -mm. Aspen has had a lot of development to the point where I'd really consider it a different thing. And mm -hmm. here is how I would frame that for people curious about the two. I'm going to borrow something uh, that my colleague Galen Charlton said the other day when he referred to Viewfind as almost more like a toolbox. And I think that's a good descriptor for it. And for institutions mm -hmm. that really need to come up with something very customized and specific to their resources, say, academic libraries. I think Viewfind is excellent. Aspen is more of a final product and very much appropriate for more public libraries that need something more, uh, to borrow a term from a different field, pret a porte more ready to wear. <laughs> I, yes. I, I should not have like mentioned that as flippantly as that. You find an Aspen, while Aspen is a fork, as you say, they are not the same thing. And what if your consortium is a mix of public and academic libraries? Um, you're gonna have to do a comparison side by side and really see um, what the priorities are for those different organizations. There's, I, and I will say too, I don't know if there is a reason to not deploy both, depending on, on who is using what. Um, you'd have to talk to a support provider that, as we know, is is flexi depending on needs. Um, so I put I was going to like put a bunch of like spreadsheet pictures and things here and I didn't. I just made a list. Uh, all of the things and this is not actually all of the things that went into um, planning for this, but we did do a services survey amongst our membership. What things are they offering to their patrons. Uh, we had to train the trainer cohort just to kind of wrangle in a, a group of um, end user experts. Uh, so many modes of training and a shout out to, to Lena Henderson, Lena Henderson, Hernandez from Equinox, who uh, was very flexible when we needed to reschedule things as well and put together just phenomenal documentation. Um, 
And then we have a plan for how we roll out administrative access. They kind of have to prove that they've done a few things beforehand because of that, uh, because of the lower number of permissions in there. And yeah, so many spreadsheets. And I'm kind of rushing through that a little bit just because I want to get to pictures. Um, so this was a big deal um, for a lot of our libraries. It's also a big deal for me um, thinking about what we can do. And I'm again thinking about the, this um, from a library director standpoint, perhaps what we can do to represent our communities, we can provide identities um, in for uh, the library and the communities. When we rolled these catalogs out, they got um, a little bit of zhuzh from the admin team. Uh, meaning that they got a logo that was put up there that was their logo um, and some links that were custom uh, to their library. And then behind the scenes, they got their own browse category groups and they got their own themes uh, so that they could go in then and customize their themes. These have been customized um, by those libraries. Uh, and there, there are more as well. Is there anything that you want to say about this aspect of it, Rogan, or do you want me no, to go ahead? And... Uh, I, I think this is an ex, I think this is a picture is worth a thousand words. And, and one of the things, uh, I guess, another thing I do want to point out here, and I tried to capture this here, is that all of these libraries also started out with four uh, browse category. So browse categories is kind of analogous to carousels, um, but it's a full page as opposed to just like a, a gallery view that the carousels in the native catalog are. Um, so they started out with adult, young adult, children's, and then a New York Times um, integration so that that was already there. They didn't have to go and figure that integration out themselves, even though it's, it's not very difficult and the documentation is phenomenal for it. But you can see here that Vernon Township already has added their own browse category for gardening. Um, Kendallville has added a few uh, browse categories. They have a um, thousand books before kindergarten kits in their library. And so they wanted to highlight those. And then Thorntown wanted to highlight their video games as well as um, books and other things to do with outdoor fun. And I, I thought that that was exciting that they were able to now highlight things in their collection that they were not highlighting before. This next one is probably, I don't, I don't know what's exciting to other people. This is exciting to me. So this is Montpelier Harrison Township Public Library and they are tiny, tiny library. Um, one of the standards in Indiana State for libraries is that they have to maintain a library website, and that has to have certain function, certain components in it. What Aspen will allow them to do is to actually not just have the catalog search, but also have their web presence in one place. It is easier, in my opinion. Uh, which take that for what it's worth. It is easier than most um, content management systems for websites. Our state does offer a free website to libraries, but it uses WordPress, which WordPress is, is great if you have the time to get the knowledge to use it. Um, it is one of the easier ones. This is easier than that. This is not a fully built out anything, um, but it is enough with the exception of having a calendar integrated, which could be to satisfy the state requirements. And for a library that has one staff member, that's pretty important. Uh, so this is one of those things uh, that I'm excited about for our smallest libraries. Um, I put this together for them in less than two hours, so which is really exciting. And then we talked about placards a little bit. 
uh, there are two different examples of placards in here. Um, one of them is to the Indiana Gateway, which is a governmental financial transparency website in Indiana. Um, and, and I hate the, to interrupt, but we are up against time. Okay, it's so we're almost done. <laughs> we're almost done. We're going to go through this real quick. Also, we have the e-resources over here, um, two different placards, one for an event, one for a service. Um, and then we have just a few comments here uh, from Richland Public Library in Washington State, and then uh, from Traverse de Sioux Library System, Minnesota, um, both libraries that have implemented Aspen as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Rogan, and final comments. I, I encourage people when we post the slides to go back and read the feedback from Teresa and Seth. I thought for giving an idea of how the implementation worked, it'd be just nice to see some feedback from a standalone library and another consortia that both mm -hmm. implemented Aspen. So you can see what the real world experience from them would be. And I would encourage you to uh, go to evergreenindiana.org and the, the um, Aspen page under member resources, we're gonna start listing other libraries that use it um, because I am a huge proponent of people uh, borrowing, appropriating, perhaps stealing, um, whatever you want to say, ideas from one another. This is an open source community and, and, and open is the way that we like it. So be inspired by one another and use those ideas and ask questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Rogan. <laughs> oh, that's a very big question, Jeremiah. Yeah, we can talk about that maybe another time, but we need to be um, uh, concerned about the folks presenting next, so. Yep. Hackfest is a great place. Come to the Hackfest. <laughs> Good deal.